so uh, welcome everyone uh, and thank you for coming to this the third lecture in our series about the pandemic um, we it was kind of subtitled first responders then and now so we've looked at typhoid mary we looked at the famine era immigrants coming in and what it meant for them and this one is the most in a way i suppose the most comparable with today because it's about the 1918 1919 spanish flu epidemic um, so i'll kind of talk you through that uh, without getting political i hope <laughs> but it's hard not to draw parallels but... oh so uh, lasting over a year the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic stands as a lasting reminder of what happens when governments and their citizens fail to meet a crisis head-on what began in army camps where 25 percent of soldiers developed a flu and then spread by fall to the civilian population this disease was not discriminatory it devastated urban populations like pittsburgh and new york but also hit vulnerable rural areas in arkansas where the public health infrastructure was essentially non-existent the first wave in spring summer of 1918 was not that bad but then the second lethal wave hit in september probably two-thirds of the deaths worldwide occurred in that second wave between late september and december it was also a third wave in march april which would have been lethal by any standard, except that the standard had been set so high by the second wave. Influenza then, or flu, is a virus that attacks the respiratory system. The flu virus is highly contagious. <clears throat> um, when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or talks, respiratory droplets are generated and transmitted into the air and can be inhaled by anybody nearby. Additionally, a person who touches something with the virus on it and then touches his or her mouth, eyes, or nose can become infected. It was caused, this virus, by the H1N1 virus, with, which had genes of an avian origin. Although there is no universal consensus regarding where it originated, it had spread worldwide during 1918-1919. It's estimated that 500 million people, or one-third of the world's population, became infected. The number of deaths is estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, with 675,000 occurring here in the States. So in the States, flu season generally runs from late fall into spring. In a typical year, more than 200,000 Americans are hospitalized for flu-related complications, and over the past three decades, there have been between 3,000 to 49,000 flu-related deaths annually, according to the CDC. In 1919, they did not know that influenza was caused by a virus, and in fact, the scientist Richard Pfeiffer had convinced most of the medical community that it was caused by bacteria. It wasn't until 1933 that researchers proved conclusively that the flu is a viral inf infection. Antibiotics capable of treating flu-related pneumonia infections, which are typically caused by bacteria, were 10 years away from being discovered. Antiviral drugs were many decades from being developed. The first came out in 1963. There was no World Health Organization. Efforts to surveil and track the outbreak of new diseases were incredibly rudimentary. Most countries in Europe were under war censorship regimes that limited the spread of accurate life-saving information about the flu outbreak. In fact, that's why it is called the Spanish flu. Spain's press was not censored because it was not involved in World War I. So unlike other countries, all of the papers carried the story of this flu, which had caused even their king to get sick, but it did not originate in Spain. With no cure for the flu, many doctors prescribed medication that they felt would alleviate symptoms, including aspirin, which had been trademarked by Bayer in 1899, and whose patent expired in 1917, meaning that new companies were able to produce the drug during the epidemic. Before the spike in deaths attributed to the flu in 1918, the U.S. Surgeon General, the Navy, and the Journal of the American Medical Association all recommended the use of aspirin. Many professionals advised patients to take up to 30 grams per day, a dose now known to be toxic. <clears throat> Symptoms of aspirin poisoning include hyperventilation and pulmonary edema, or the buildup of fluid in the lungs, and it's now believed that many of the October deaths were actually caused or hastened by aspirin, aspirin poisoning. Mm -hmm. So we'll just kind of do um, that's a, a look at a diseased lung, a, a flu lung, not not um, you know a mustard gas or anything. So you can see lots of you know kind of holes and droplets, uh, severe damage. And normally lungs are quite pink. <laughs> so in April of 1917, the U.S. entered World War One. There were 378,000 people in the armed services. In June, the draft was established to increase the number of soldiers, and the army began training recruits at 32 large camps each housed between 25,000 to 55,000 soldiers. 
In March 1918, outbreaks of flu-like illness were first detected in the United States. We don't know where it started in the world, but it was uh, the first reported outbreak of lethal influenza anywhere was from rural Kansas, a small town in Haskell County. In January, an outbreak so severe that although influenza was not then a reportable disease, a local physician named Loring Minor, a large imposing man, gruff, locally involved in politics, who became a doctor before the acceptance of the germ theory of disease, went to the trouble of alerting the US Public Health Service, even though this was not reportable. The report itself no longer exists, but it stands as the first recorded notice anywhere in the world of unusual influenza activity that year. The local newspaper, the Santa Fe Monitor, confirms that something odd was happening at the time. Mrs. Eva Van Alstine is sick with pneumonia. Ralph Light Lindemann is still quite sick. Homer Moody has been reported quite sick. Pete Hesser's three children have pneumonia. Mrs. Cox is very weak yet. Ralph McConnell has been quite sick this week. Most everyone over the country is having the grip or pneumonia. So from there, that town in Haskell County, you can track the people who left there and headed to Fort Riley. Albert Gitchell, an army private and mess cook based in Fort Riley, Kansas, is sometimes identified as the first victim, recording his symptoms on March 4th, 1918. More than 100 soldiers at Camp Funston in Fort Riley became ill with flu. Within a week, the number of flu cases quintupled. And unfortunately for the world, American soldiers at Fort Riley were at that point preparing for deployment to the Western Front of World War I. A month later, the flu was epidemic in the American Midwest, on the cities of the Eastern Seaboard from which the soldiers embarked, and in the French ports from where they disembarked. Whether it began in the trenches or ended up there after the arrival of American troops, the virus spread quickly to German soldiers and to neutral Spain. News of the flu was censored in most countries, uh, except Spain. Russian POWs returning from Germany spread the disease to the newly created Soviet Union, and by May and June in 1918, various countries in Africa, as well as India, China, and Japan, all had outbreaks. This is the first wave. So while it had significant effects, uh, particularly on the war, because it weakened the troops on both sides, it was not the debilitating crisis that happened later. In America, although few died in the spring, those who did were often healthy young adults, people whom influenza rarely kills. Some deaths in the first wave were overlooked because they were actually misdiagnosed, often as meningitis. A puzzled Chicago pathologist observed lung tissue heavy with fluid and full of hemorrhages and asked another expert if it represented a new disease. So in, 1919, in 1918, there was a generally mild spring wave which was hit or miss. New York, Chicago, and Louisville, uh, as well as other places around the world, had pronounced but localized outbreaks. Los Angeles didn't record a single death. So although it was generally mild, there were hints that it could be deadly. In one small, small army post, it killed 5% of the soldiers. Even as his city reeled with the onset of disease, New York City's uh, public health director waved away calls for greater vigilance, finding that other bronchial diseases and not the so-called Spanish influenza caused the illness of the majority of persons who were reported ill. But the Federal Public Health Service encouraged cities and states to adopt best practices in the earliest days when quarantines and shutdowns might have flattened the curve to use our uh, contemporary parlance, the US Surgeon General Rupert Blue assured Americans there is no cause for alarm if precautions are observed. A nonchalant remark that newspapers reported, but which imparted a false sense of calm. Even when the body count manifestly demonstrated otherwise, Colonel Philip Dome, who led health and safety at the military shipyards where the disease first spread, dismissed the so-called Spanish influenza as nothing more or less than the old-fashioned grief or gripe. In August, then, the affliction resurfaced in Switzerland in a form so violent that a US Navy intelligence officer in a report stamped secret and confidential warned that the disease now epidemic throughout Switzerland is what is commonly known as the Black Plague, although it is designated as Spanish sickness and grip. So, of course, this was all happening at the high water mark days of America's involvement in World War I. The federal government compelled, shamed, and goaded citizens into conforming. From the Sedition Act, which forbade interference in the sale of war bonds, to the legions of four-minute men who delivered patriotic speeches in movie theaters as the reels were being changed, to say nothing of violence against German Americans, public spirit demanded that the parade go on, that parades and all these meetings go on. So this is George Creel, who was in charge of the Committee on Public Information, kind of the PR guru for Wilson's government. President Wilson was fighting two kinds of war, the Great War in Europe, which was in its final stages, 
but also, of course, this pandemic. Uh, and he chose to fo focus his efforts on the battlefields of Europe, virtually ignoring the disease that was now ravaging the home front and would eventually kill 675,000 Americans. In fact, the 28th president never uttered a single public statement about the flu pandemic. His lack of leadership on the flu did not necessarily come from ignorance of how serious the disease war was. There were reports of illness striking young, healthy soldiers in military barracks and on the transport ships where overcrowding and poor sanitation was rampant. And he must have heard these. According to Alfred Crosby's America's, Forgot America's Forgotten Pandemic, the influence of 1918, Wilson actually asked the Army Chief of Staff, General Payton, in um, Payton March in October of 1918, if he had heard a popular jump rope rhyme which parodied the virus, and he actually recited part of it. I had a little bird, its name was Enza, I opened the window and in flew Enza. Because of the war, Wilson had created this propaganda machine, the Committee on Public Information, whose uh, basic kind of um, architecture was the force of an idea lies its, in its inspirational value. It matters very little if it is true or false. So to keep morale up during the war, the government lied. National public health leaders said things like, this is the ordinary influenza by another name, trying to minimize it. At Wilson's urging, Congress passed the Sedition Act, making it punishable with 20 years in prison to utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States, or to urge, incite, or advocate any curtailment of production in this country of anything or things necessary or essential to the prosecution of the war. Government posters and advertisements urged people to report to the Justice Department anyone who spreads pessimistic stories, cries for peace, or belittles our efforts to win the war. So, this was the background against which influenza was bleeding into American life, with public health officials determined to keep morale up, starting to lie. Across the country, public officials were lying. U.S. Surgeon General Ra Ra sorry, Rupert Blue said, there is no cause for alarm if precautions are observed. New York City's public health director declared other bronchial diseases um, and not the so-called Spanish influenza caused the majority of illnesses. The Los Angeles public health chief said, if ordinary precautions are observed, there is no cause for alarm. And it wasn't just the White House or government. Federal and local health leaders downplayed the severity. A local paper in Arizona called the Arizona Republican said, uh, reported that a Camp Dix health official reassured they have the epidemic under control. Another paper advised the public, don't get panicky. Wilson era health officials were trying to keep morale high and energy focused on the war effort. Um, so this uh, strain you know, was continually undermined. Blue, the Surgeon General, has been described as a master bureaucrat, but failed, he failed to heed warnings of, seek advance information about, or prepare for the epidemic. A scientist at the National Research Council working on medical matters regarding the war complained about not being able to get information about the spread of influenza in Europe from his office. And when the pandemic overwhelmed the Minnesota hospital system, Blue suggested, rather than required, that public gatherings should cease. Then White House staffers started to come down with the contagious virus. A private letter to Mississippi Senator John Sharp Williams was notable, notable for being one of the very few times that President Wilson ever spoke or wrote about influenza. And it was just a passing reference. I would have answered your letter of October 14th sooner had not my secretary been absent with influenza. People staffing uh, around the president continued to fall ill, including a Secret Service agent, the White House usher, and a stenographer. The illness followed when Wilson went to Paris to negotiate the Treaty of Versailles after World War I. A young American aide in the peace delegation, 25-year-old Donald Freire became ill with the flu and died. And around that time that Freire got sick, so did Wilson himself. Some newspapers initially reported that spring that the president had caught the flu over there because he came down suddenly with a 103 degree temperature, coughing spasms, and gastrointestinal symptoms. Today, historians disagree about whether he had caught the 1918 flu or a different strain. He did recover, but suffered a stroke that left him incapacitated for the rest of his term. His illness would have long-term consequences, however. Having held firm all along to his own principles and those of the US before the war and in the early days at Versailles, perhaps because of his temperature and feeling ill, he appears to have been disoriented in the talks before he took time off to recuperate. And so somewhere in those talks, he caved into, as he was called, Tiger Georges Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, 
who wanted punitive damages awarded against the German state and insisted on the war guilt cause being adopted. Because of this betrayal of Americans' principles, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, called Wilson the greatest fraud on earth. As for the press, there was plenty of concealment there too. For example, the press's failure, for example of the press's failure, consider Arkansas. After a four day period in October, the hospital at Camp Pike admitted 8,000 soldiers. Francis Blake, a member of the Army Special Pneumonia Unit, described the scene, every corridor, and there are miles of them, with double rows of cots, with influenza patients, there was only death and destruction. But seven miles away in Little Rock, the headline in the Gazette yawned, Spanish influenza is playing the grip, same old fever and chills. But people knew this was not the same old thing. They knew because the numbers were staggering. In San Antonio, 53% of the population got sick. They knew because victims could die within hours of the first symptoms, horrific symptoms, not just aches and cyanosis, which is when you turn a little bit blue, but a foamy blood coughed up from the lungs or bleeding from the nose, ears, and even their eyes. People knew because towns and cities ran out of coffins. The lack of trust made it harder to implement critical public health measures in a timely way because people did not believe what they were being told. And by the time the government was forced to be transparent about the situation, it was too late. The virus had already disseminated. News from the battlefield covered newspaper plates each day, and it often overshadowed the reports of flu deaths. The limited coverage of the flu meant the disease was mostly viewed through a local lens. When a virus, the virus struck a town or city, it consumed life with quarantines and closures of businesses, schools, and banks. It created a sensation of fear and mistrust. People were worried because they weren't told anything. So how long would it last? How many would it kill? Who would it kill? With the truth buried, morale collapsed and society began to disintegrate. The Red Cross reported instances of people starving to death in rural communities because everyone was afraid to bring them food. The panic and the fear was that intense. It stretched society to the brink. In Michigan, a couple and three children were sick together, but a Red Cross worker reported not one of the neighbors would come in and help. I telephoned the woman's sister. She came and tapped on the window, but refused to talk to me until she had gotten a safe distance away. In New Haven, Connecticut, John Delano recalled, nobody, when someone was sick in those days, would bring food over to other families. Nobody came to visit. In Kentucky, the Red Cross chapter chairman begged for help, pleaded that there were hundreds of cases of people starving to death, not from lack of food, but because the well, the well people were panic stricken, would not go near the sick. An internal American Red Cross report concluded a fear and panic of the influenza akin to the terror of the Middle Ages regarding the Black Plague has been prevalent in many parts of the country. And of course, then, in the absence of calm and steady leadership from the top, there was no shortage of hucksters standing by ready to profit from fear. Uh, one doctor, Dr. Franklin Duane, gave interviews and ran advertisements for a fake home remedy, Dr. Pierce's pleasant pellets, arguing that the more you fear the disease, the surer you are to get it. Dr. Bell's pine tar honey, Shank's mandrake pills, Beecham's pills, and Miller's antiseptic snake oil promised protection or relief from the flu. When Vicks vapor rub is applied over the throat and chest, the medicated vapors loosen the phlegm, open the air passages, and stimulate the mucous membrane to throw off the germs. There was a photo of boys with um, little camphor around their necks. So the second outbreak, much more fatal. Um, an estimated 195,000 Americans dying during October alone. Uh, of course, by the end of the war, the military had grown in size from 378 in April when they entered the war to 4.7 million soldiers by the end. Uh, and of course, November, the end of World War I, enabled another resurgence because people celebrated armistice days and soldiers began to be mobilized. So New York City's Board of Health added flu to the list of reportable diseases and required all flu cases to be isolated, either at home or in a hospital, just at the end of the summer in 1918. Um, By the end of September, 14,000 flu cases were reported at Camp Devons, equaling about one quarter of the total camp, and that resulted in 757 deaths. So the hospital then at Camp Devons, which was kind of the, the next big outbreak, this was an army training base 35 miles from Boston, could accommodate 1,200 patients. On September 1st, there was 84 patients. On September 7th, a soldier was sent to the hospital delirious and screaming when he was touched, diagnosed with meningitis. The next day, a dozen more men from his company were diagnosed, and as more men fell ill, physicians changed the diagnosis to influenza. Suddenly, an army report noted the influenza occurred as an explosion. At that outbreak's peak, 
1,543 soldiers reported ill with influenza in a single day. So now, of course, hospital facilities were overwhelmed, doctors and nurses were sick, too few cafeteria workers to feed patients and staff. The hospital ceased accepting patients, leaving thousands more sick and dying in the barracks. Roy Grist, a physician at the hospital, wrote to a colleague, these men start with what appears to be an ordinary attack of influenza, and when brought to the hospital, they very rapidly develop the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. Two hours after admission, they have mahogany spots over their cheekbones, and a few hours later, you can begin to see the cyanosis. This is when you turn blue from lack of oxygen, extending from their ears and spreading all over the face. It's only a matter of a few hours until death comes, and it is horrible. We have been averaging about 100 deaths per day. For several days, there were no coffins and the bodies piled up something fierce. So that, Devon, in the Boston area, was the first place hit by the second wave. Now, of course, they're experiencing a severe shortage of nurses because the deployment of large numbers of nurses to military camps, both in the US but also abroad. And um, many hospitals refused to use trained African-American nurses. Illinois passed a bill to create a one-year course to become a practical nurse, an effort which was trying to address the shortage. Then Boston, 202 people died on one day, October 1st. Philadelphia would later top that record. The Chicago chapter of the American Red Cross um, issued an urgent call for volunteers to help nurse the ill. Philadelphia um, is hit hard with the pandemic flu as more than 500 corpses await burial, some for more than a week. Cold storage plants are used as temporary morgues the manufacturer of trolley cars donates 200 packing crates for use as coffins. Chicago closes theaters, movie houses, and night schools and prohibits public gatherings. San Francisco's Board of Health requires any person serving the public to wear masks and issues a strong recommendation to all residents to wear masks in public. New York City reports a 40% decline in shipyard productivity. According to the New York Times during the pandemic, Boy Scouts would approach people they'd seen spitting on the street, giving them cards that read you were in violation of the sanitary code. Salt Lake City officials placed quarantine signs on front and rear doors of 2,000 homes where occupants have been struck with flu. And finally, in December, public health officials begin education programs and publicity about the dangers of coughing and sneezing and careless disposal of nasal discharges. The Committee of the American Public Health Association encourages stores and factories to stagger opening and closing hours and for people to walk to work when possible instead of using public transport. So, um, We'll get to Philadelphia. So, you know, September of 1918, we talked already about um, it had just kind of outbroken in the Camp Denver's in Boston. A Navy ship from Boston carried influenza to Philadelphia where the disease erupts in the Navy Yard. The city's public health department, Wilmer Crewson, declared that he would confine this disease to its present limits and in this we are sure to be successful. No fatalities have been recorded, no concern whatever is felt. The next day, two soldiers died of influenza. Cruzan stated they died of old-fashioned influenza or with not Spanish flu. Um, so this is one of the army hospitals in Arkansas. Uh, another health official declared from now on the disease will decrease. The next day, 14 soldiers, the sailors died and the first civilian. Each day the disease accelerated and every day newspapers assured readers that influenza posed no danger. Cruzan assured the city he had or would nip the epidemic in the bud. Sounds very familiar. By September 26th, influenza had spread across the country and many military training camps were beginning to look like Devon's. Uh, so in fact, the army canceled the nationwide draft call. World War I and the upcoming bond drive was of course still the dominating feature in the headlines and in public consciousness. And although the war was drawing to a close, Philadelphia had been tasked with raising $259 million for the Philadelphia boys fighting in Europe. So the city had scheduled a big Liberty Loan Parade for September 28th, this is it. Doctors urged Cruzan to cancel it, fearful that hundreds of thousands jamming the route, crushing each other for a better view, would spread disease. They convinced reporters to write stories about the danger, but editors refused to run them and refused to print letters from doctors. The largest parade in Philadelphia's history proceeded on schedule. The incubation period of influenza is two to three days. Two days after the parade, Cruzan conceded that the epidemic now present in the civilian population was assuming the type found in the army camps, but he urged caution and not to be panic-stricken over exaggerated reports. 
The newspapers were on his side. Scientific nursing, halting epidemic, ran the inquirer's headline. In truth, nurses had no impact because there were none available. Out of 3,100 urgent requests for nurses submitted to one dispatcher, 193 were provided. Cruson finally and belatedly ordered all schools closed and banned public gatherings. But a newspaper nonsensically said the order was not a public health measure and there was no case for, for panic or alarm. But of course there was plenty. At its worst, the epidemic in Philadelphia killed 759 people in one day. Priests drove horse-drawn carts down city streets calling the residents to bring out their dead and many were buried in mass graves. In total, 12,000 Philadelphians died in six weeks. There were multiple letters from physicians not just asking but demanding that they cancel the parade. And of course, these had all been ignored. City officials, after the numbers skyrocket, order schools, theatres and churches closed indefinitely. And then the bars, the pool rooms, the dance halls, hotels, barbershops, restaurants and lunch counters were left open. But employees were required to cease work upon the first sign of them getting the flu. Funerals could only be attended by adult family members and could not be held in a church or public space. And all public gatherings, like the parade that had occurred just days earlier, were prohibited. <clears throat> so these um, measures were met with considerable skepticism in Philadelphia. In fact, one of the newspapers, The Inquirer, uh, accused city officials of going daft. What are they trying to do? Scare everyone to death? The newspaper wrote in an editorial, the fear of influenza is creating a panic, an unreasonable panic that would be promoted, we suspect, by the drastic commands of the authorities. Steer clear of it. Talk of cheerful things, of health, for instance, instead of disease. The closing of saloons sent hundreds of Philadelphians to Camden, which shuttered its own bars two days later, in part to discourage thousands of people from bringing influenza across the river. At another point, thieves broke into a wholesale liquor establishment in Centre City, decorating the place with signs ridiculing the city's orders. But not everyone opposed the stringent restrictions. Jules Mastbaum, who was president of the Stanley Company, which controlled many of the motion picture theatres, was emphatic regarding the closings. In our theatres, since the disease was first observed, we used every sanitary precaution known to the science of medicine. But one of the most difficult things to do is to keep afflicted people out of the theatre. In fact, it's impossible. And the authorities have taken the only step that was left them. Meanwhile, the city's death toll continued to rise. And the surrounding regions, particularly Camden, Chester and Gloucester, were hit hard because the disease proved far more severe than the first influenza outbreak. Victims died within hours of showing symptoms, coughing up blood from their lungs, bleeding often from their nose and ears and eyes, much worse than the original flu. An entire victims fell victim, entire families fell victim. In Camden, Robert Nelson, an electrician, fell ill after a week spent caring for 10 others in his house, including his mother and seven children. And these stories played out across the region. Some people died without ever seeing a doctor or a nurse. Hundreds of children were orphaned after their parents perished. Hospitals filled so quickly that makeshift emergency hospitals popped up across the city and the region. Beds were set up in the Armory, the Republican Club, and several Catholic parishes in Philadelphia. Students at Bryn Mawr College scrubbed floors and cleaned windows to open the old Lancaster Inn for patients. Doctors and nurses were in such demand that they worked around the clock, foregoing sleep and falling ill themselves. Dr. Frank Stem ignored a court summons because he had so many urgent flu patients, and then he fell sick himself. By October 5th, 40 nurses at Philadelphia Hospital had broken down from overwork, and that's just one week in, prompting an appeal for voluntary nurses. Six days later, five nurses had died after refusing to cease their care of about 1,200 patients. No soldier on the field of war battle could be any more courageous, the superintendent William McAllister told the evening public ledger, nor are the nurses on the front one whit more heroines than these girls. Conditions became so dire that nurses occasionally were kidnapped on their way home. One man pulled a nurse into a Philadelphia taxi cab, offering her any amount of money to treat his ailing wife. Many were appealing for help at City Hall, a sight the newspaper described as pitiful. Women are crying because they can find no one to go to their homes to attend their children, and children were crying because they could get no one to see their sick parents. The epidemic devastated the workplace. At one point, 2,000 Philadelphia transportation workers called out sick. So many Bell Telephone Company employees fell ill that the company restricted its lines for emergency calls only. People died so quickly that the city's undertakers could not keep up. 
Bodies piled up so fast that Philadelphia's only morgue at 13th and Wood Street in the heart of the city contained several hundred corpses. Its capacity was 36. Bodies were stacked three and four deep, covered only by dirt and blood-stained sheets. Most were unembalmed and not stored on ice. Some bodies were mortifying and the stench was nauseating, stated a 1918 report that was submitted to the chairman of the Philadelphia Council of National Defense. In the rear of the building, the doors are open and bodies lying all over the floor, a spectacle for gaping curiosity seekers, including young children. More than 1,000 bodies were awaiting burial by October 12th, adding another health concern. Many bodies remained inside city homes for days at a time because family members could not find undertakers or they were too ill to take action. Bodies spilled out of the city's morgue, prompting Commonwealth Brewing Company to offer the cold storage plant as a temporary facility for 500 bodies. So then hundreds of city laborers were tasked with digging out graves and constructing coffins. Prisoners were ordered to assist them. Catholic priests and seminary students picked up shovels too. There is a pressing need for grave diggers, coroner William Knight told the Evening Public Ledger, to relieve the situation and eliminate the menace of the bodies. Hundreds of loyal citizens ought to step forward today and serve as grave diggers in the city cemeteries. Uh, families began arranging temporary burials until a permanent burial could be obtained. Um, Rabbi Rosenfeld of the Romanian congregation in South Philadelphia was among those who could not find an undertaker. So he opted to bury his son Jack on his own, knowing that the body would decompose. With the help of a friend, Rosenfeld built a casket and hired a wagon to cart his son's body to Mount Carmel Cemetery. Uh, Rosenfeld helped to lower his son, who was a senior at South Philadelphia High School, into the grave. Jack was such a good boy, such a smart boy, Rosenfeld told the paper, and what an end. Despite the shortage, some undertakers came under scrutiny when they started upcharging. One undertaker reportedly commanded $500 per burial, 350 more than the standard funeral charge. Others auctioned off pine boxes to the highest bidders. Undertakers were not the only ones looking to profit from the epidemic. The price of oranges, which was recommended by doctors, increased from 40 cents to $1.50 per dozen. So, California, Specifically, LA and San Francisco dealt with the pandemic much better than Philadelphia. Its leaders were blunt about the threat, so the cities functioned better because the community came together quicker. After the outbreak, the San Francisco Chronicle proved that when the city's history was written, one of the most thrilling episodes would be the story of how gallantly the city of St. Francis behaved when the black wings of war-bred pestilence hovered over the city. In Los Angeles, like everywhere else, the first signs of trouble arrived in mid-September 1918 when sailors aboard a Navy ship in San Pedro fell mysteriously ill. By the end of the month, 55 students at Polytechnic High School in downtown LA had this mysterious bug. LA's response in the coming month would be crafted by a headstrong North Carolinian, Dr. Luther Milton Powers. Uh, he manages to stay in power through the tenures of at least half a dozen LA mayors, and he was the health commissioner. He called the cases publicly alleged influenza, but he advised Mayor Frederick Woodman in private to prepare a campaign to stop the epidemic in Los Angeles, which was then a city of fewer 600,000 souls. By October the 11th, the mayor had declared a state of emergency. Commissioner Powers ordered most public gathering places, including movie houses, theaters, and pool rooms, closed at, as of 6 p.m. that night. Adding a peculiarly LA flavor, Powers told the city's movie moguls that they would have to stop filming mob scenes. <laughs> LA theater owners protested that the shutdown should be broader to stop the virus more quickly. They demanded the closing of shops and department stores, but Powers thought that was too impractical and so stores remained open. Uh, now, San Francisco, even though its first cases appeared at the same time as those in LA, the Board of Health there did not vote to shut down all places of public amusement until a week later, October 18th. And that does make a difference in their figures. The city did not include churches in the shutdown, leaving that to the leader's discretion. LA stuck to its more rigorous response despite considerable pushback. Religious leaders questioned the constitutionality of closing churches, and the Ninth Church of Christ Scientist, which was on New Hampshire Street, reopened, but the leaders were promptly arrested. The city shut down its Liberty Day parade. In Los Angeles, residents had at least one less opportunity for getting sick. San Francisco's leaders eventually closed a significant number of public facilities, but they obsessed on a singular response to the disease, face masks. 
That response came courtesy of the city's health officer, Dr. William C. Hassler. He had drained a claim after the great earth earthquake in 1906 for helping to fight off a rat infestation amid fears of bubonic plague at the time. Hassler came to believe that face masks would help San Francisco tamp down influenza, which experts theorized had been brought back from Europe by these soldiers. So by October 25th, the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco required every resident and visitor to the city to wear a mask. The Red Cross pronounced that man, woman, or child who will not wear a mask is a dangerous slacker. The majority complied with those who did not, fined $5. Slackers were jailed and San Francisco's lockup soon filled with malfactors. Even with less rigorous restrictions, new influenza cases had declined enough that by November 13th, Hassler recommended reopening San Francisco. When the ban officially ended on November 16th, San Franciscans swarmed the theaters, movie houses, and sports arenas. The city's stringent mask law did remain in place, but residents of the freewheeling Baghdad by the Bay had grown tired of the pesky shrouds. A photographer caught Hassler and the mayor, James Rolfe, at a boxing match, both with their masks off. Hassler said his mask must have slipped off as he smoked a cigar. He paid $5 on the spot. Rolf agreed to pay the then hefty fine of $50. Within a few days of that, the city leaders believed that the plague had eased enough to end all restrictions. At noon on November 21st, a whistle sounded across the city and many ripped off their masks and threw them into the streets. The San Francisco Chronicle said the sidewalks and runnels were strewn with the relics of a torturous month. LA went in a different direction. Despite repeated attempts by Mayor Woodman and others, the city council refused to order Los Angeles to wear masks, with the exception of health workers and those known to be in contact with influenza patients. But LA had gone into quarantine a week before San Francisco and it stayed shut her longer. So reopening the public facilities didn't happen in LA until December 2nd. That meant that LA's controls, even though it didn't have face masks, stayed in place 16 days after San Francisco lifted restrictions and it had began seven days earlier. That 23 day isolation was an advantage. Locales, both of them learned that they had not been cautious enough. There was a quick jump in cases in LA leading to a reclosure of the schools and they did not open again until January 1919. San Francisco saw its own spike in influenza deaths and ordered the public to put their masks back on on January 10th. And again, they wouldn't take them off until February. So out of these three cities, Philadelphia, which had no restrictions, had an excess death rate of 748 per 100,000 population, one of the worst in the nation. LA experienced one of the lowest epidemic rates, 494 deaths per 100,000. And San Francisco was closer to uh, Philadelphia at 673. But again, they didn't have any of that quarantining for 23 days. So the failure of Philadelphia's government to respond quickly and forcefully really alerted other elected officials. Uh, cities like San Diego um, particularly learned from the eastern cities like Philadelphia, Boston, and New York, and that city acted quickly to close churches and dance halls, libraries, swimming pools, any public meetings except outside war bond drives. Police enforced these measures aggressively. When the number of infected citizens did not immediately drop, municipal officials worked with the Red Cross to produce and distribute thousands of masks, which many citizens balked at wearing despite the entreaties of public health officials. The San Diego Union dismissed the very idea out of hand, observing that modern civilization has abolished the mask as part of the human wearing apparel. Only highwaymen, burglars, and hold-up men wear masks professionally. Still, the city's early and active efforts contributed to smaller mortality numbers than other municipalities. So this third outbreak then was less severe than the second wave occurring in kind of the spring of 1919, uh, but it was more deadly than the initial first wave. Isolated outbreaks occurred throughout the spring in Los Angeles, New York, Memphis, Nashville, St. Louis, or St. Louis. Overall American mortality rates were in the tens of thousands in those first six months of 1919. And strangely, after the third wave, the 1918 virus did not go away, but it lost somehow its extraordinary lethality, partly because maybe the human immune systems recognized it, and partly because for some reason, and it mutates very quickly, it lost the ability to invade the lungs. So it just became an upper respiratory tract infection. And it evolved or devolved into a seasonal influenza. Scientists and other experts still ask questions about the virus and the devastation it caused. 
including why was the second wave so much more lethal than the first. Researchers aren't certain. Some argue that the first wave was caused by ordinary seasonal influenza, which was very different from the pandemic virus. But the evidence seems overwhelming that the pandemic virus had two forms, a mild one and then a violent one, which caused mild as well as severe spring outbreaks. And for some reason that remain unclear, the violent form of the virus became more common in the fall before once again falling off in the spring. Because there was no coherent national or federal policy to deal with the 1918 epidemic, states came up with their own plans with very success. In 1918 and 1919, some cities imposed restrictions, but they often lifted them too soon and then had to reimpose them again. As with today, it was the frontline workers who bore the brunt of the work. Among those tasked to care for the sick were the Navy's nurses. The, UN, the US Navy uh, Nurse Corps numbered around 1,500. And as is the case for maladies with no cure or no effective treatment, nurses and their care were often the difference between living and dying. Several nurses died after exposure, of course, to the flu. But three of them were posthumously awarded the Navy Cross, which is the second highest decoration in the Navy or Marine Corps. And yet, despite this staggering loss of life, far more than died in World War I itself, it has been coined the forgotten illness. The biggest lesson of the 1918 influenza epidemic, according to historian John Barry, was that leaders need to tell the truth, no matter how hard it is to hear. Barry, who wrote a critically acclaimed book on the 1918 pandemic, says that lying about the severity of the crisis in 1918 created more fear, more isolation, and more suffering for everyone. Trust in authority disintegrated, and at its core, society is based on trust. Barry wrote in a recent New York Times column, not knowing whom or what to believe, people lost trust in one another. They became alienated, isolated. Intimacy was destroyed. When you mix politics and science, you get politics. So, the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's a bit deja vu-ish, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I have to say, I was kind of mind blown, you know, when I was doing some of the research and looking at the pictures, you know. Uh, it, it's incredible how similar, you know, the outbreak and sometimes the reaction and everything has been. Questions or comments? <laughs> oh, so this is actually from 1930 something. But look, you know, they're still a bit worried about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing that I sort of noticed, especially with all the like the public health campaigns, like the "Don't Sit" posters. Um, obviously, it like people didn't necessarily have the same technology we have now, but they knew more than like perhaps like one um, doctor found the literature talking about the famine for sure. Mm -hmm. And it made me think this summer, of course, when we saw so many protests across the country, a lot of people's public health concerns like that. Protesters are getting uh, repelled with tear gas, which makes you cough and hack and all these things. And clearly, this was more than just a military outbreak. People all over the country, all over the world, were getting it. But I'm wondering, since tear gas was like first used in warfare, large scale during this war, did anyone think, either at the time or perhaps retrospectively, that that was what was at least advancing the the disease within? The yeah. army, like I was saying, know that yeah. people were living in literal trenches on the ground and there's not good food or anything. There's so many other public yeah. health concerns that it's not the only thing that you could point to that made it clear that this was spreading fast. But I wonder if anyone ever thought, like, people choking and spitting and, you know, yeah. throwing up from yeah, yeah. the gas, is that making this worse or everyone around that? There definitely <laughs> has been, like, when I was doing the research, you know, I came across some of those articles that kind of suggested that the mustard gas yeah. and things. But, you know, the numbers are just kind of so overwhelming in the civilian population mm -hmm. as well. So it, it isn't just, I mean, you would think that the trench is exactly the perfect place right. for it to spread. But you know, that first outbreak dies down. Right, yeah. And so, um, I, you know, there isn't really an explanation. Like, maybe God loving the ones who were gassed, you know, kind of die in yeah. area or, um, but you know, when like the, the lung at the start, like that does look like a mustard gas right. kind of destroyed lung. Mm -hmm. So there, it, it was strange, you know, I think, it doesn't appear to mean that like more soldiers died than civilians, you know, that, mm -hmm. that isn't the case. It, it's a very strange, I don't know how it didn't spread, because again, 
you know, they're trench foot, right, like they yeah. don't, they're not eating right, it's damp conditions, they're living in close proximity. I don't know how more of them didn't die from it, but you know, it, it appears. Now maybe, maybe like it did incubate there and yeah. that's what brings it back because it, it definitely is originating in, in training camps mm -hmm. and on board ship and things. Right. But it's, um, it, it doesn't appear to have attacked the soldiers, particularly like active duty soldiers, any more than it did, you know, civilians. Mm -hmm. Questions? My grandmother, Barrett, her twin sister, mm -hmm. died at 13 in April of 1919. Mm -hmm. 32 hours from vibrant, healthy 13 year old girl to dead, oh. bleeding out of the mouth, the nose, the ears, the eyes, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, mm -hmm. up in Shazy, New York. I mean, just yeah. 32 oh, hours. Yeah. It's incredible, you know, like to think, yeah. For, for years, she wouldn't, my grandmother wouldn't even admit that she had a twin sister. Oh. Wouldn't, wouldn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until uh, last or second last time that I went to see her in Florida and I got her uh, uh, on tape mm -hmm. talking about it. It's the first time she admitted that her sister had even existed. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, it's not like, because I was going to talk a little bit about that too, you know, at the start, people were misdiagnosing it aside from meningitis, but even as cholera, because the colors yeah. were so bad and the vomiting and the blood. So, I mean, you know, you probably grief rather than shame, you know, is, is kind of what prevented the story. But, you know, it's incredible to think how fast, you know, 30, did you say 36 30, hours? Or, yeah. 32 hours. 32 mm -hmm. hours, I mean. So it's, and it, it affected, that was the thing too, I don't think I made that very clear. It was the younger, like it was that healthy age group, older people who didn't die mm -hmm. in the numbers that, you know, kind of young adults mm -hmm. or into their 30s and 40s died. And so they suspect like maybe the older people had caught a form of the H1N1 virus earlier in their lives. And that yes, this was a fastly mutating you know, virus, but that for some reason they, they might have had a kind of an immunity to the original first outbreak from an earlier disease in their own, you know, childhood. Um, but it, it's young people and, and young adults that, you know, are absolutely just devastated, you know, by it. So it, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I'm thinking like about the, the nursing shortage, especially on the East Coast there. Um, it seems to sort of coincide with, of course, the end of the war, not really the absolute end, but around that time. Um, and there's clearly things like racism at play with not availing of yeah, the help of African American nurses, but was the shortage overall just because there were so many nurses like with the army in Europe or was it because people were like so afraid of trying to treat these people that they just wouldn't do it? Or yeah, like, I had the numbers and I don't know what I did with them. I think it was because a lot of them were serving in Europe. Okay. You know, there was more than kind of half of the nurses mm -hmm. had gone there. Um, and I suppose, you know, the mortality rate was probably pretty high among those the first responders. Mm -hmm. So. But yeah, and I mean, probably they're just not turning out enough nurses. Like the numbers in the military, I couldn't get over that. Like that it goes from 300 and something to 4 million right. soldiers. Yeah. It was like, oh, yeah. you yeah. know, that is just incredible. So there's obviously a kind of a lag be be between all the other services then that mm -hmm. you need to boost up, you know, to get to those levels. So yeah, I think they didn't have enough. Like Chicago and a few other cities passed these very quick certifying courses, but you know, women were just starting to enter the workforce mm -hmm. too. You know, not every kind of, family would have agreed to educate their daughter or could afford to educate the daughter. So, you know, I'm sure that was a factor too, just the demographics of, of women pre-voting, you know. <laughs> yeah. Any questions or comments? Weren't the pictures amazing? Yeah, they're great. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, I, I mean, it could be, it really could be today. <laughs> Which is, you know. It is today. It is today. It's it's yeah. Look at us in the room. Yeah, this kind before of. I walked in. Uh, uh, the press secretary, Kaylee. Uh, oh, Mackin. Mackin. She, she has it now. Yeah. She's announced that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose we're lucky that COVID seems to be, you know, now they know how to treat it a bit. But like, we're lucky that you just medicine has improved so much in the hundred years, you know, but like those early days. And I mean, now I, I read an article the other day that said they think it might be more a vascular, you know, system than it is a respiratory disease. So like they're still learning you know but like intubation does not seem to be the way to go because mm -hmm. that weakens your system so but it's just you know when you look at these like no social distancing <laughs> going on on the church right. steps you know 
And, and what is amazing to me is the attitudes, you know, exactly the same. Like you could read those quotes today about masks, you know. Social media has had it made a good round of that photo. I think it's in San Francisco or somewhere out west. It's the whole family and their cat. They put a mask on their cat, like oh. their dog, into it. Um, which is funny because, like, even yeah. this time around, like, there's supposedly been animals that have caught yeah, um, right. coronavirus, yeah. and like, obviously, like, these originate in certain animals yeah. like, like, as well. So it's just yeah. literally full circle. I mean, yeah. So, and to think, you know, they still don't know, like, they've never been able to figure out, yeah, like, mm -hmm. I can't remember what the word is, codify the gene, or, you know, like, they've mm -hmm. never gotten, we still don't have a proper flu, you know, vaccine mm -hmm. in a way, right. and that's because that it just, mutate so quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's very worrying, really, when you think, you know, and I mean, the lesson about communication and about everyone getting on board and being honest, like you can see, I mean, I don't know how many things I read on Twitter on Friday about does he really have it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So if, if we can't even believe, you know, a, a White House statement, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> it's, we're into kind of a twilight zone, mm -hmm. you know. But, but I think this situation is, com the current situation is complicated a little bit by the key players having been so unbelievable. In oh, the past. sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't think it has, I think that has less to do with yeah. this crazy pandemic than yeah. it does with some of the players involved. Right. It's just yeah. not as trustworthy. Well, you know? 20 something thousand lives, right. you know, according to independent <laughs> assessors. Right. Right. Yeah. right. No, it doesn't excuse it yeah. all. It's just, it's, it's just insane how, yeah. how similar the, the circumstances are. Yeah, no, it is. Well, and you know, like I, I was reading, and I, I always hate reading the comments on social media, so <laughs> I, I try not to sometimes, but you know, people saying, well, there are not 200,000 dead, there's only 9,000, and you're like, oh, oh my God. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, you'd say something in these times where, you know, they didn't have very good record keeping. Right, right. Like, even 50 million is kind of an estimate. Some people go as high as 100 million, yeah, right. because it goes, it was across the world, right, right. people, it was a war zone, you know, like, they just didn't have, A, the paperwork, and B, the medical knowledge to right. know, you know. And so, but to think like we are tracking the numbers, mm -hmm. like we have a system, we know how to count, you know, it, yeah. it's very frightening. And just the people who genuinely believe that this is all happening, like everyone is falling like dominoes because it's a conspiracy and yeah. the fact that we genuinely understand how germs spread. Yeah. Better definitely than a hundred years ago, definitely. Yeah. You know, there's still plenty of things that we have to learn, but just like yeah. people who, which is scary, not just for like us and, you know, people who have to live with them around it, but like for them too, like if yeah. they genuinely don't take this seriously, like they could be next. Like, I know, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, it's still killing yeah. people. Well, like when I was, you know, I was looking at the Creel things, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, like there's one of the Liberty Bonds, like your first taste of American yeah, exactly. Liberty by, uh, you know, yeah. and I just thought, oh my god. So like you can imagine the, the, um, the pressure mm -hmm. like, that was on, you know, and, and it was everywhere. Like they, Robert Prager was hanged, you know, for mm -hmm. being a German American. Um, we, this committee on public information, you know, Teddy Roosevelt gives a speech about hyphenated Americans. There's a big mm -hmm. pushback like against Irish and German who want America to remain neutral that had nothing to do with the health scare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, it, you know, like to be kind of causing this paranoia mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, deeply patriotic kind of stuff is, is very concerning back then, you know, but, mm -hmm. Um, at the same time, they sort of, you know, had some standards <laughs> in terms of the information they were giving out, you know. And I mean, Wilson, I think it was known that he was sick at the time, yeah. you know, and, and so there he is in, in negotiations. But, you know, like they were upfront about that kind of stuff. Um, but it, it's very... Was there really a straight up explanation as to their approach? Was it just that they didn't want to distract from the war or was it this like modern day thing where they didn't want to cause this because like c c communication was so different obviously people yeah. who were in really badly hit areas knew that it wasn't just a regular flu because they were seeing it all around them but like right we didn't have like like your news sort of stopped in your local community yeah. unless you lived in a big city where you got like a newspaper that covered a, you know world events as well as local it, it, so i how, don't know like, if there was to be honest much thought you know but mm -hmm. like certainly the the Sedition Act and all of this Committee on Public Information, they don't want anything negative at all to detract from morale, you know, mm -hmm. so, I mean, that seems to have extended to the health epidemic that was going on. Gotcha. But for him, you know, 
it's not even mentioned in his private papers right, much, you yeah. know, and he starts, imagine like the president not addressing the fact that however, you know, millions died of the flu in the same year as a war, it, it's kind of incredible, you know. But I, I, and I think the press seem to have kind of gone in with that, that we're in a war that's right. focused on one thing at a time. Probably there was an element of it's, it is only the flu and mm -hmm. it will go. And I think, you know, I think it's that wave thing. Mm -hmm. When the first wave was over, you know, and then the second wave hits, very, like it is literally within a week, you know, of these parades, two days after the parade, and then mm -hmm. a week later, you know, there's 100,000. And so I, if it had happened less quickly, you know, kind of thing, there might have been more of an effort. But I, I think they just go from zero to hero, and, you know, it's, it's almost too late to kind of issue a warning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they, they did seem to be abiding by the good news only, you know. <laughs> well, I do think that, that part, <coughs> excuse me, that may be a, a big difference between then and now. Yeah. Is um, perhaps because of so many things that are happening and yeah. at, at prompts questions about government behavior, there is uh, a media less likely to, you know, go along. Yeah. You know, I, I was reading something, it was, it was almost slightly connected to this, it was about presidential diseases mm. um, recently, and, and it talked about well, it was connected to President Trump, but why this need to have information about him and, and how different that is, even from John Kennedy and going back mm -hmm. much further. I mean, it was Kennedy, it was Roosevelt, it was, mm -hmm. it was Wilson it, with his stroke. Mm -hmm. and, excuse me. Um, yeah, they didn't even photograph. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, just there was a, a very strong willingness, whatever the president wanted, mm -hmm. and that is so different now. Mm -hmm. um, it could be because of who's in the White House, but mm -hmm. I think it also has more to do with just our general time. Yeah. There's there's so many uh, media platforms. There's the yeah, traditional yeah. media, the social media. There's ways to get this information or pieces of it. And you have social media, yeah. even, you know, yeah. 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 Um, and so people ask questions. Is it true? Do you mm -hmm. believe it? Is it a hoax? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it just creates this, this need. You know, nature affords a vacuum. And so mm -hmm. in versus the, the little facts and tidbits and some mm -hmm. of them are true and some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. But people won't let it go. No, um, and I think. I mean, I I believe that's the purpose of the fourth estate. You know, sure, like it is sure. to hold up, you know, power kind of and make it accountable. And sure. you know, that's why it's really like important that we do have objective media. And you know, there's a concern that when corporations own all of the outlets, bar you know one or two kind of fringy ones. Mm -hmm. So it, it you know that is concerning. One of the I, I can't remember what the historian was. It starts with the T. It might come to me in a minute. You know, they, there's a book about like the worst American presidents, and that guy said that Wilson was because of his lack of response to the pandemic, oh, which is wow. interesting. Yeah. Now this was written before. <laughs> no, you know, before 20. Oh, I don't know when. Before class. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I'm not saying that there's another candidate coming, but it's passed. But so yeah. Well. <laughs> but FDR, yeah, for his lack of a response, was apparently in this guy's eyes the worst president. Yeah. You know, which is interesting. You know, I mean, there's other things you could criticize Wilson for too, you know, maybe, but this one is a big, yeah. Well, weird because he's, I mean, he, I mean, I don't think he's a weird in general, like Lincoln and stuff, but he has like this yeah. sort of cult of personality. Like, oh, yeah, he's not like, an Andrew Jackson. Like, no, exactly. Yeah. He's like, he's mm -hmm. weirdly furry in and out of the cathedral, but not, like his Catholic just on the outside. Like, if you go there and you're going to visit it as a monument the way a lot of people would, yeah. his Catholic, like Mary front and center sort of, I yeah. forget the architectural term, like right sort of behind the altar. Um, and I remember going to DC, like when I lived there, there was this whole week in February every year where like the cathedral was open for visiting and they did weird stuff like on different days, like one day, like indoor picnic day or yeah. yoga and all these things. And they're just like setting up in this building where like this guy, this president, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he's not the only president there, but like mm. that sort of stature, which is sort of only maybe like a step down from like being buried at Arlington National yeah. Cemetery. And I know like basically we ask in this country like anyone who pulls that office is worthy of these really, really high honors. But then yeah. you see people like that get it alongside like actually, you know, like yeah. George Washington, Lincoln, those people who literally like held our country together. Yeah. Some of those words signs is interesting because I think, that, you know, his record is under scrutiny for a lot. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Like there's not, like there's not really that much you can say that he did that was like, uncontroversial good. Yeah. <laughs> but well, in his personal beliefs, you know, it's yeah. funny that they were never kind of questioned until recently. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. yeah, people were like, fine, yeah. you know, extreme racism. Extreme racism, yeah. 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 yeah.
yeah, it, it's an interesting, you know, I don't know, I just, I, I kind of found it a little bit sad. Definitely. Yeah. You know, that we're still, you know, hovering around with this, that this is still the conversation kind of that we're having, mm -hmm. you know, considering how much more you think we would know now. And like that's, you know, there was no Fauci, there was no CDC, no. there was no, right. I mean, in a way they did the best that they could in one way, you know, like considering there was kind of national coverage and, you know, masks. So, th so there was no national public health service the way no. there is now. No. Did, is that what gave rise to our current public health system? Or I have a feeling, well, you know, so I was reading one article and it said that FDR actually caught the flu as a younger man. He, he visited Europe and the troops and came off, the, he had to be stretchered off the boat anyway. And so they reckon this might have been a kind of a foundational, huh. you know, happening in his life that means he goes and, and uh, inspires the New Deal where is when we get a lot more of the federal. Uh -huh. But the government just were not involved in people's lives the way, you yeah. know, that they're kind of arguing we shouldn't have it today. <laughs> but, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so a lot of that I think comes with the New Deal. Because huh. mm -hmm. I think the military was otherwise a big public help. Yeah. The movie that I mean, obviously it was a different audience, but the whole idea of like, this is also time people starting to wonder or figure out like, sexually transmitted diseases. Yeah, and, like, yeah, that's yeah, not no, a thing. That's, you know, you know the answers that were secretly handed out to troops in World right. War you know, got with the rest of the population. Would look exactly. There is a surge in general. But I think you're right, like I think most, they were kind of more military based than anything yeah. else, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so. that's, yeah, that's what it makes sense. Yeah. Work. But just, to, I, I confess that, you know, I, well, gosh, I feel like I should know this, particularly given our current situation, but I, I wonder when the public health service got launched and, mm -hmm. and it has it always been such an uphill battle for those people. Oh, you know? I'd say so, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. I, I do think it was New Deal era. Yeah, like, um, the, like the NHS in the UK, yeah. Of course, everyone sort of thinks of either very controversially or the gold standard as post World War II. Yeah. So yeah. I guess that it has to be perhaps it might around have been that even time. before like <laughs> the yeah, war, like or even that yeah. War. I, I think it was New Deal ish, and then yeah. I think after war because you know then you have the UN and yeah. the World Health Organization. You know those kinds of things started yeah. cropping up in the forties and fifties. So presumably, if it didn't already exist in America, they would have made yeah. something by that point. But yeah, like in terms of cooperation right. there was none you know huh. yeah it's funny yeah. you know yeah mm -hmm. it, it's so interesting mm -hmm. and then of course now how many players in that particular area are being sidelined yeah know? i mean I, I wonder if there's always been this battle um between political leaders and and public health people you know as long as the, the service is existing i mean yeah. you can see that it's a fraught kind of situation regardless of who the players are yeah you know? I kind of assume, though, that they were seen as civil servants who worked for them, like, you know, more in a way than, you know, the FBI and uh -huh. CIA, that they kind of were more trusted as, you know, an entity that didn't non, serve any non one. Non-partisan, yeah, non scientists yeah. and exactly. civil servants. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think they really were, I mean, you know, you're right, JFK hid his back problems and all that, you know, like, there was still a little bit of, that kind of level of cooperation between press and maybe the health officials, you know, and, and the private life, we'll call it, of the president. But I think really we haven't started to see that until very recently. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, it, I probably did get part of that in the 70s ish, you know, mm -hmm. with certain uh, politicians. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think there has been, uh, you know, I'm sure they were seen, particularly at the start, as absolutely, you know, unimpeachable yeah. and trustworthy. Yeah. You know? well, I just also think too about some of the, the really this this is certainly an extraordinary example, but um, I'm thinking of polio. Yeah. You know the whole push to get a vaccine for polio, yeah. and I, I guess I just assumed that was a public health initiative, but maybe it wasn't. Yeah. Well, it probably was. You know, maybe this is what spurs that kind of greater cooperation. Like I know the iron lung thing comes out in the thirties. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, like I'm sure that some sort of a CDC type thing or American, you know, medical or whatever they are, has to have been sort of FDR era. Yeah. yeah. But I maybe mean, a little bit earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I and and you see, I, yeah, I think this frightened them so that when polio comes, like and TB, there had been right, huge right. TB er, yeah. earlier than this, you know. Yeah. Um, so some of the big, you know, yeah. health scares that we've had since this 
Um, yeah. But like TV, so there was some fantastic pictures of New York, you know, doing outdoor schooling and stuff, mm -hmm. but it was 1912, 1914 yeah. with the TV. Yeah. And, and so again, like, you know, very much down to the individual yeah. states. But there probably was, you know, information sharing yeah. between states, just nothing centralized. And it's interesting that this was a state level sort of fight. Yeah. Um, and then with our current situation, yeah. the states were like flummoxed. Yeah. Yeah. They were anticipating a federal response, um, and you know, I, it doesn't sound like the governors were doing a whole lot of history reading either. You yeah. Know? yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, particularly look at how they were able to use the you know mandating manufacturing during World War Two. Like, you know, had that happened, sure, which I think sure. everybody intended for it to happen. <laughs> you know, yeah. this or expected it to happen. Like, that's why it's there. There should be a federal centralized, even FEMA, like which came you know right, way right. afterwards, because they, someone needs to know where the need is, where the stuff is, and, and how to get it there, yeah, you know? Yeah, that's and so, yeah. you know, you can't really have 50 states doing that on their own. Well, no, you it's know, not different when yeah, it's this year. Um, yeah. It's just, I, I didn't, I, I didn't. I didn't I but it's funny know. that there is a pushback against that when we know that not having it is terrible and having it worked mm -hmm. great right. <laughs> during right. World yeah. War II. You know, right. so. Funny how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, the whole states' rights sort of argument, you know, we won't even get into that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's a piece of it. Yeah. yeah. You know, so many political concerns. Well, it's hard not to get political with this, I think, you know, because even though we try not to, but clearly I have opinions, you know, well, that yeah. are on one side. Sure. Yeah. 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 But it, it like as a historian, it is terrible when you see you know not learning from history. You know? Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this so thanks nice. guys for coming out. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, we'll see. I hope there's not ten people locked out outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a really good talk. Yeah.